Okay, I am going to go over test F from your review book, parts two through four. Starting with number five, given that f of x is a linear function, they want to know what the value of g of x would be when you sub it into this function here. So all you really had to do here was to take what they told you f of x was and just sub it in right inside of the brackets in place of the function f of x. So that's what I've done here subbing in the 2x plus 1 right inside the parentheses. And then from there, you just want to make sure you're following order of operations. Okay, so we know that we need to use our exponents first. So I'm repeating this binomial twice. 2x plus 1 times 2x plus 1. That product is going to be multiplied by 2 or doubled. And then lastly, of course, we will subtract 1. Now, I like to double that first binomial and get that 2 out of the way, okay? And then I have binomial times binomial. Just be careful. When you double 2x plus 1, you've got to make sure that you put that in parentheses so that then you can use a distributive property between the two binomials and then subtract the 1. If you don't choose to double the first binomial, that's fine. You could multiply these two binomials out and then take that answer and double it, and then subtract one. Just be careful if you do that. You've got to make sure that you, once you multiply out these two binomials, that you keep that product in parentheses, so the entire product is doubled before you subtract the one. So there's a lot of places here that you could make little mistakes. You just have to be very, very careful. Okay, going on to number 26, they want to know if the product of these two radicals is rational or irrational. So the first thing you want to do is follow your rules for multiplying radicals. We want to multiply together the coefficients that are in front of the radical symbol. So 3 times 8 is 24. And then we can multiply together the numbers that are under the radical symbols to get a radical 36. Okay, radical 36 we know is a perfect square, so the square root of 36 is 6, and then following order of operations, multiply that by 24 to get 144. And to answer the question, is it rational or irrational, it is rational because the answer, 144, you could say is a terminating decimal, or you can say 144 can be written as a fraction. Okay, number 27. All they want us to do here is simply to graph this quadratic function. So this is a pretty easy question. Your calculator is going to do most of the work for you. Okay, so going to your calculator and in your y equals putting in this quadratic function and coming up with a table of values as you see on the side. Whenever you graph, you want to show the person grading your paper, what method you used, whether it be a table of values, or as we know with a linear function, we would state the slope and the y-intercept. So when we look at our graphing calculator to get our table of values, remember that we are looking for symmetry in those y values. So the top three y values here are the same as the bottom three down here, giving us our vertex in the middle, okay? So that, in this case, is going to be the minimum point of our quadratic. So we come over and we plot the points, and of course we always label any graph that we make, and since there is no scale established on the graph, please make sure that you establish your scale all the way around the graph. Okay, and of course, this is not a restricted domain, so please do not forget to include arrows on your function. Okay, then down at the bottom, they wanted us to state the equation. Notice I've underlined equation twice, because if you just write 2, you will not get full credit. That's not an equation. Remember that our axis of symmetry is the vertical line that cuts right through the vertex or our turning point. It cuts our quadratic in half, okay, so there's symmetry on both sides. 
being a vertical line, that's going to be an x equals equation. The 2 is the x-intercept where this vertical line crosses through the x-axis. Okay, so on number 28, they want to know um, if the solution 7 halves or 3.5 and negative 6 are the solutions to this quadratic function. Well, whenever we solve an equation, when we're done, we typically will check it by substituting back in our values to see if they work. So even though I don't show that here, that would be a really probably much easier way than using the quadratic formula, which most students don't like to use, and it also is an opportunity for mistakes. Um, you could take the 3 and a half and the negative 6, sub them into that quadratic function, and see if it checks. And if they do, then when you explain, you would just have to explain what you had done. Subbing them in, um, working out the problem, doing the math to make sure that you had equality on both sides. Okay? But if you didn't choose to do it that way, I tend to do things the long way. Um, I use the quadratic formula um, because we have the coefficient of a 2 here in front of our x squared term. So I wouldn't be using completing, I wouldn't choose to use completing the square. Um, I could look to factor it, but I tend to want to use this. For me, I prefer the quadratic formula. So you've got your a value of 2, your b value of 5, and your c value of negative 42. Subbing those into your quadratic formula, okay, going through the math there, be very careful underneath the radical symbol, okay, You've got a negative here times a negative, so we end up with a positive. That's a very common spot to have a mistake. Okay, we're getting down to here, and 361 happens to be a perfect square, so that's cool. Um, and then when we get to this point, let's split it. I like to split into the positive, okay, the negative 5 plus 19 divided by 4, and then the negative 5 minus 19 divided by 4. Now on the graphing calculator, you can hit the alpha y equals button and you have the ability to put a fraction in your calculator. I would input this there. Okay, So I would put negative 5 plus 9 in the numerator, go down to the denominator, put a 4, hit equals, and you will come right to this answer. That way you're letting the calculator determine what needs to be done as far as order of operations go, and you are not going to make, hopefully, a calculator error. Okay? And yes, it does work out, so we need to make sure we always answer the question. Um, do you agree with Amy's solution? So it would be a yes, and then explain why or why not. So my explanation was because when I use a quadratic formula to find the zeros or the solutions, um, I ended up with negative 6 and 3.5, just like Amy. So depending how you do it, your explanation could be a little bit different, but always make sure you go back and read the question so you make sure that you answer what's being asked and you give an explanation if it's needed. Okay, number 29. Sue and Kathy were doing their algebra. They're asked to write the equation of the line that passes through those points. So Sue wrote hers one way and Kathy wrote hers another we're more familiar with the way that Kathy wrote her equation as a linear function. Okay. Now, what we're going to find out when we work out Sue's, we're going to find out if that is works out if that's going to work out to be a linear function as well. Okay, just written differently. Okay. So here we're good. What I'm going to do with Sue's is I'm just going to work it out following order of operations and put it into slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. So first thing I'm going to do is use a distributive property and get rid of that fraction in the front outside, or get rid of the parentheses, actually. So when I do that, you see what I get. And then to get it into y equals, I'm just going to add 4 to both sides. And then voila, when I do that, I see that they are exactly the same. Okay? And they told me that both students were correct, but this is proving why they're both correct, because they end up being the same exact linear function. Okay, going on to number 30. 
Okay, during a recent snowstorm, there were four inches of snow on the ground at 3 p.m. and six inches at 7 p.m. If we want to graph this data, what does the slope of the line connecting the two points represent? In the context of this problem, you've got to be careful about this. When they say in the context of the problem, they do not want a generic explanation. They want you to make can ex write an explanation that uses the exact details from this problem. So the first thing I did is I just made a little table of values over here. And in there, I put down the times that they had given me and what was going on at those times. At 3 p.m., there were four inches of snow. Okay. Now, the time is going to be our x value, of course, and the y value is going to be the inches of snow. Well, this is when I first start recording the data. So at 3 p.m., that is actually time of zero. No time has gone by. It's when I first start recording. So at 7 p.m., which is four hours later, there are six inches of snow on the ground. So now I have myself two ordered pairs that I can use to find the slope. So I have 0, 4 here, and I have 4, 6. So using these, I did my change in my y values, of course, in the numerator, change in x in the denominator. Reducing this, two forces half an inch um, of snow. Okay. Now I'm going to write it as a rate so that I can use that to help me explain. Now that 0.5 is going to be half an inch of snow every one hour. Now I know inches is the numerator because inches is my label for the y values. And hours is my label for the x values from the denominator. So then I just write that out because they do ask, what does the slope represent? Represent every one hour, it snows half an inch. Okay. Even if you, even if you didn't do this, because that might confuse some of you, two force reduces to half an inch, of course. And then you can say that, then you know that because it's your rate of change, it's per every one unit, okay? So it's half an inch every one hour. Okay, number 31. They give us the formula for finding the sum of the degree measures of the interior angles of a polygon, okay? So the sum is going to be equal to, I happen to know this formula, you're probably not familiar with it, but... The N in here stands for the number of sides of the polygon. And if you subtract 2 from the number of sides that the polygon has, and then you multiply that answer by 180, you will find out the total number of degrees on the interior angles of a polygon. So using that formula, they want us to solve in terms of S. So that means they want us to get this equation to be, no, no, I'm sorry, solve for N. Hello, okay, so ignore that. Solve for n, they want us to get it in n equals, because of course it already is in s equals. So we need to isolate the variable n. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to get rid of this 180 that's in the pr outside of the parentheses near the variable n. So to do that, because 180 is being multiplied by n minus 2, I'm going to divide both sides by 180 to cancel it out of this side. So then I end up with this right here. Okay. By doing that, by getting the, rid of the 180 that's out in front, then I can remove the parentheses and I just have the expression n minus 2. So then at that point, I'm almost done. All I need to do to get n all by itself is just to move the 2 to the other side by adding 2 to both sides. Now when you do that, just be careful. This is a fraction, s divided by 180. Just leave that as a fraction. The positive 2 is being added to it. So you don't want to include that in the numerator or the denominator of your fraction. You just want to leave it by itself as it's being added. Now, that's one way to look at it, and that's one acceptable answer. Another way is if you distribute that 180 that was out in front of the parentheses, okay, you get 180n minus 360, and some of you may be more inclined to do it that way, and then you're going to avoid that fraction we had there, you're still going to end up with one, but through division. And you might feel more comfortable with that. 
So adding 360 to both sides and then dividing by the 180 that's here, okay, and ending up with that answer. And just leave it like that. You don't need to do any simplifying or anything. If you go on and simplify it, be careful. You may make a mistake and then you're going to lose credit. This is an acceptable answer. Okay, number 32. We have a cubic function graphed here, which is f of x, which is this one right here at the top. Okay. So there's our f of x. And also graphed is g of x, which is the result of a translation. So we know a translation is a slide. It could be up, down, left, right, or a combination of those. So g of x is down here. And we can tell that it's been moved down for sure. Okay, so it's ending down here at negative 4 on the y-axis. It started up here at 0 on the y-axis. So we can tell that it's been moved down 4 units. Okay, they want us to determine the equation of the transformation, where it ended up, our image. So to do that... All you have to do is you take the original f of x, okay, f of x was x cubed plus 2x squared. So if you take that original and all you do is put a minus 4 on the end of there, that would be your new function for g of x, okay? Moving it 4 units down, that would be our y-intercept of negative 4. And we're pretty familiar with the y-intercepts being at the end of our function rules. Or another way is writing it in function notation, just saying, hey, g of x, the new cubic, the image, would be the old function f of x minus 4. By putting it on the outside of the parentheses, it means that we are translating the function down 4 units. Um, we have to explain. Explain your reasoning. It doesn't have to be fancy just that g of x moved 4 units down from f of x. Very basic. Okay, number 33. So looking at another quadratic function. Um, this quadratic function represents the height of an object dropped from the top of a building after t seconds. So they want to know how many feet did the object fall between 1 and 2 seconds after it was dropped. So, of course, I'm going to input this quadratic function into my y equals on my calculator so I can look at the table of values. Now, I actually wrote down more values than I needed, but I like to take a look at it so that this um, table can tell me a story about the object. So I can see at zero seconds that the object is 144 feet off the ground which I can also see by the end of my quadratic function up there. Um, and then I can see that at 3 seconds, it hits the ground when the height is 0. So now I have a little story going in my head. I know what's going on here. And I can see where it is at 1 second and where it is at 2 seconds as it's falling towards the ground. And they just want to know how many feet it fell between 1 and 2 seconds. So you're simply just taking the height at... One second, the height at two seconds, and subtracting them. Pretty easy stuff there. Okay, determine algebraically how many seconds will it take for the object to reach the ground. How many seconds means we are finding the x values. Okay, and for the object to reach the ground, well, it will reach the ground when the height is equal to zero. I can also tell from my table up above, okay, that it's going to happen going to reach the ground at three seconds. But they say determine algebraically. So even though my table already shows me the answer, which is pretty cool because I know what to expect as an answer, I still have to show the algebraic work to get to that answer. So the height will be zero, okay, when it hits the ground. And with these numbers being as big as they are, I want to take out a greatest common factor if I can. So by dividing both sides by negative 16, I take my equation right down to this, which is very simple, okay? Not as possibly confusing as the original looks, okay? If you're thinking about factoring it or anything like that. 
So when I get down to here, if I want to solve for t time, I can add 9 to both sides, and then I just end up with t squared equals 9. And solving a square root function, we can just take the square root of each side. Now, I caution you because mostly when students do this, they only come up with one answer, which is 3. Because you often think of square root of 9 is just 3. Well, every number has two square roots, a positive value and a negative value. So we're going to have a positive 3 and a negative 3. I rejected the negative 3 because obviously time is not going to be negative, And then I show what my final answer is. Now, if you get back to here, when you have t squared minus 9 equals 0, if this method over here is not the way you want to solve it, this is a dots, right? Difference of two perfect squares, because we have a perfect square here and a perfect square here. This factors to t plus 3 times t minus 3 equals 0. So then that means here t is equal to negative 3 and t is equal to positive 3. And then, of course, you would reject this one. So that's also another way to get there. Um, so I use factoring. You could have also, when you got to this point, you could have used um, completing the square, although I, I don't think I would for that one. It's much easier to factor it. And I also could have used quadratic formula if I wanted. Okay, on number 34. So we are going to graph two inequalities. And it tells us up in the problem the information to write those inequalities, as you can see what the result of those words are. Um, and then I had to get them into slope-intercept form, so transforming them. So we have y is greater than here and y is less than over here. And then remember the method of graphing. Tell the slope, tell the y-intercept of both of those functions so that then if you go on to make mistakes after in your graphing, at least we could see you knew what they should have been. That will help you with getting some points. Okay, I like to then also note whether it's a dotted or a solid line, okay, and whether we're shading above or below. This is greater than, so we're shading above. This function is less than, so we're shading below. Now, both of these functions will have dotted lines because their inequality symbols do not contain an equal. Remember, if there's an equal to, they are solid lines. Okay, so you can look at the graph to see everything that's going on here. Don't forget there was no scale, so you establish a scale. Okay, um, you're graphing each function as we normally would for a linear function. Um, and you notice my lines are dotted, and I had to shade above, right? Yep, above on one and below on the other. So let's see, this is, has a y-intercept up here of 8. So this one was shaded below, okay? And then the other function was shaded above. Did I mess up here? Yep, I did. Sorry about that. It's hard to tell, and the lines are all black, so it's hard for me to tell which is which. Hang on. B is 8. Yep, I was thinking this was out of 10, so that was an 8, but that is not true, right? The way they have this graph, it's mostly the first and second quadrant, not a lot below. So apologize there. This is going to be a B value of 14. This is 8, okay? So the, where the y-intercept is 8, for that line we are shading above. So I'm going to take that out of there. Okay, there's our 8. So here we're shading above. There we go. It's easier when they are in two different colors so we can see, because otherwise it kind of looks like a mess. Okay, and when the y-intercept is 14, right here, then we are shading below. I hope the color helps. And then where they overlap right here, you must put an S to represent the solution set. Okay. Also notice my labeling. Okay. When I was shading above, I look to the above shading and I label with the original inequality. The below shading, okay, down below here, and I label with the original inequality. Okay. And they want to know if 6, 2 is a solution to this system. Determine if it's correct, so we have to answer yes or no, and explain our reasoning. Okay, now 6, 2, 
Where is six two? Let's see. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, right here. There we go. There is six two. They want to know if that is in our solution set. Well, as you can see, the V comes down for our solution set and it comes right to here. Now, if these were solid lines, the answer would be yes. Because solid lines means include in the solution. But these are both dotted lines. So because they're dotted and the point is right on them, then the answer is no. Okay? They are not in the solution set. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Oh, the airplane problem. Okay, so this problem was rather confusing to students the year that they took this. There's a lot going on here, a lot of details you have to read extremely carefully. Okay, um, extremely well and very carefully. So determine the speed of the plane at cruising altitude in miles per minute. So we can see that miles per minute is going to be a rate. They want to know speed. Now speed is equal to distance divided by time. So what I'm going to do is see how far I went in between the 192 miles and the 762 miles. My distance was 570 miles. Those numbers came from the problem above. Okay, now the time is just subtracting the 92 and the 32 to end up with the 60 minutes. Divide those out and you have a rate of 9.5 miles per minute. Okay, um, if you weren't sure what to divide, okay, this rate right here helps you. It's miles divided by minutes. I always look to the label if I'm not sure about what order I'm supposed to be dividing in. Now they want us to write an equation to go with this to represent the number of miles the plane has flown during X minutes at cruising altitude only. Well, we know that speed, well, we did up above we did speed as distance divided by time, but we know that distance is equal to speed times time. So we have our distance here that we can find. We take our speed and multiply it by the time. Well, the speed we calculated above in the first part. Our time is going to be our input variable, x. And then we can output the distance, y. OK, going down to the bottom. Assume the plane maintains its speed at cruising altitude. Determine the total number of miles the plane has flown two hours into the flight. Now remember, two hours into the flight, that plane was not at cruising altitude the entire two hours. So we need to subtract out from that two hours, which is 120 minutes, we need to subtract out the 32 minutes that it was not at cruising altitude to find out that the time that it really was at cruising altitude during two hours would have been 88 minutes. And then we can multiply that by the speed of 9.5 and end up with a distance of 836 miles at cruising altitude. So you've got to really be careful, as I said on this problem, about the details. Okay, so there are 836 miles at cruising altitude, and then we can add in the 192 miles that it was not at cruising altitude, okay, for, represented by that first 32 minutes. So then we have to add that back in to get the total miles that the plane went in two hours. Again, a lot going on here, okay? Now that that's one way you could solve it. You could also come over here and take your two hours and you could subtract out the 92 minutes that is the total flight from above, okay, and then you could take your speed and multiply it by the minutes left over, which is 28, to end up with 266, and then add it to the miles that you had already gone in that 92 minutes, okay? So you already know at 92 minutes that you're going to go 762 miles. So subtracting that from two hours, you only need to figure out how many 
how much how many more miles you will go for those remaining 28 minutes add them together and of course you can see you get the same answer obviously okay going to number 36 this is very unique here um, we have a piecewise defined function right here f of x and g of x is a linear function they want us to graph these on the same set of axes and then we'll answer a question at the bottom so again establish your scale going around your graph okay show your method of graphing for linear we've got a slope and a y-intercept for the piecewise defined we have tables of values and it's nice if you label the top of them so that we know which table goes with which function pay particular attention to your domain values right here that you're going to be using so here you're going to be starting with negative one okay and going to values that are less than negative one and because we have the equal to right here when we graph this this will be a closed circle now our domain for the quadratic function that's in our piecewise defined is going to start at negative one but only using values that are greater than negative one so that would be not included that would be an open circle when I graph that point that's our starting point for a graph but we're not including negative one and one in our solution in our graph okay so that is going to go greater than so we are headed up to bigger numbers there in our domain values so you graph all of that and you should end up with a function two functions that look like this okay notice this is where I said we'd have closed circle we have open circle right so where it's closed then we jump up it's open it's a continuous function there and then our linear function is going right through there okay so then it asks us how many values of x satisfy the equation when is function f equal to function g well we know that when we graph systems that when two functions cross or intersect that is a solution to both equations so right here where that happens and we can't tell exactly what that value is but we can tell that the functions intersect at one point which makes it one solution and then to explain that okay the explain part is just to tell that's where they you know we have one solution because there's one point of intersection okay make sure there's nothing else okay and last problem number 37 okay so they want us to write a system of equations using the information from the top and when you write them this is what you should be getting now don't forget also if they didn't tell you if they didn't define the variables you need to do it with let statements but since they did we're good to go okay so then we need to graph those and these are not super friendly for graphing certainly there we can do it but what you need to do is to put your equation in y equals or slope intercept form you can see my transformation here till I end up with this okay but like I said not as nice as we would like them to be the y intercept the slope is fine and so what I did was I decided that I was not going to do to um, use my y intercept and then use my rate of change I decided that I was going to go to the graphing calculator and input this function rule into y equals and look at the values in my table okay and I only picked out values that were easily graphed I definitely took this one even though we have a 0.5 here at the end because that is our y-intercept so our starting point but then after that I picked values that would be easy to graph okay and so that started me here and let's see five two three five my last nice point was here and then just lining up very nicely with my ruler and I'm even a little high here but then I'm intersecting the x-axis somewhere down there okay somewhere a little between six and seven so then I did the same thing over here for this function and notice that because our rate of change is a half that it works well to pick the even domain values they're easily graphed 
Okay, so that would be my second function there. Okay, and I'm going all the way over here as far as I can. Um, notice that I've established a scale by numbering both of my axes, and not only that, but I have labeled them. Now you may be wondering, okay, which, how would I know which one is cupcakes and which one is brownies? Okay, well they tell you up on the top that x are the number of cupcakes. So I put my cupcakes on the x-axis, my brownies on the y-axis. Now, they have a point of intersection right here. I can't tell what it is, okay? But I can see that they do intersect somewhere between 3 and 4 on the x-axis and somewhere between 4 and 5 on the y-axis. So that's good to know because now I know when I get to the next part that my answers for number of cupcakes, okay, is going to be somewhere between 3 and $4, and the brownies will be between 4 and $5. So if my algebraic solution at the bottom doesn't work out to be in between those numbers, then I know I've done something wrong. So they want us to determine the exact cost of a package of cupcakes and one package of brownies in dollars and cents. Justify your solution. Just going to be showing the work. Okay, Solving the system algebraically. I have two ways you could do this here. You could just simply go to your graphing calculator and you could input into y1 and y2 the two function rules. And then remember that we can go to the calculate menu and choose number 5, I believe it is, intersect, to find the point of intersection of our system. Or you could use the algebraic method over here. Because the function rules are in y, they're both in y equals, then that means one function equals the other. Okay, so right here you can see one is equal to the other. I just solve it algebraically and I find out that x is equal to $3.50. The x was the cupcakes and that works out nicely because that's right in between 3 and 4, okay, for that point of intersection. So that makes me happy. And then to find the value of the brownies, I'm just going to take my $3.50 and I'm going to substitute it in to one of my function rules. And actually, as I'm looking here, I really should have substituted into one of my original function rules in case I had made a mistake when I had transformed them. Okay, that's one thing I just noticed. Um, this is still acceptable, and you know it works and all, but you just want to try and avoid any places where you would make a mistake. Also, if I solve it algebraically like I did on the right, then go to the graphing calculator and find the point of intersection as another confirmation of the correct answer.